Hello everyone, my name is Corazar, and welcome back to the Vintage Story Guide. We are back on this rainy, rainy day. Now that winter's over, we're getting no snow and all rain. As you can see, we have a temporal storm approaching, and it's going to be here pretty darn soon. And so I'm going to bunker down, and I have a few modifications I want to make to our little hidey hole here. So I'm going to go ahead and make those. And I will probably skip the storm as usual. Uh, but then I'll bring you all back when it's over. We can go through the spoils and see if we got anything good. And then we will continue with the main topic of today's episode. Well, that was a pretty decent haul for the temporal storm. Now these are still low weight drifters because of it's still being kind of cold out. So I didn't get quite as many spools as I think I might have if this were later spring or summer. But we did get two temporal gears because there were two double headers. We got 10 rusty gears and we got 12 flax. So not bad. In between episodes, I have been busy putting together some of the things we need for this episode. Now, we are still going to do some prep on screen here, but I wanted to get a whole bunch of stuff done off camera. First, I started by grinding some more limestone. Then, I visited the nearby trader that I noticed in his badly damaged cart. He wasn't what I was looking for, so I burned down his cart. Just kidding. But I was so saddened by the lack of a building materials trader that I went to a grassy knoll and picked flowers till I felt better. I also surveyed the nearby geological strata for ore potential. Then I came home and sheared all the leaves from the walnut trees that had grown up near the barn, and then chopped them down. I also discovered that I had been away from the barn for so long that our ewe had given birth, and it had already grown up into an adult ewe. Our hogs had also had their litter of piglets, and they squeal and run every time we were near. So I fed the animals. <laughs> then I played choo-choo trains with the drifters. After that, I visited the chickens, fed them, and I culled the wild stock. Then I dug out a whole lot of sand. And a whole lot of peat. Then it was back to the quern for me. Since we don't have a building materials trader to sell us plaster, we're going to have to do this the old-fashioned way. Then I replaced a whole bunch of tools. And then I multitasked. While the tools were cooling, I did some more limestone grinding while I heated 20 ingots worth of lead. Then I poured the lead into ingot molds. I made another trip to the fog-shrouded peaks of Larch Mountain. I wanted more larch seeds, and I also wanted some wood now without having to wait for the trees to grow. Don't worry, I replanted the trees. Maybe someday we'll come back, take out all the pines, and replace all of them with larch trees. Then I did a very silly thing, and I took a peek down some shafts at the base of Larch Mountain. I see something interesting, if dangerous, in the depths. We'll come back for that later. I went down another one of the Larch Mountain shafts. This one went so deep, I could see lava at the bottom. Then I wanted to do something new and exciting, so I went home and ground some more limestone. After that, I spent the night clearing and hoeing our new crop fields. The drifters really wanted to help, but they don't exactly have a green thumb. So they watched on with envy, and sometimes rocks, while I planted our crops. We are going gangbusters with flax, because we need a lot of it. I also planted our other crops, starting with the cabbage seeds we found. Then I replaced all of our blackcurrant bushes in the vineyard with red currants, because I had finally found enough bushes out in the wild. I had always wanted to do this, since the red currants are more visible. We just didn't have enough until now. Then enough of our terra preta down in the valley had recovered for me to dig it up, place it in our third new field, and till it with a hoe. Then I went back down into the valley to plant our pumpkin seeds. Unfortunately, I also discovered that using the scythe too close to a grand pumpkin seed cuts the seed, and you don't get it back. So I was so sad that I went back to grinding limestone. And then we had a temporal storm. And that's about where we're going to pick up today. And I wanted to show you a bit more of these pumpkin seeds. I wanted to get them in the ground without explaining while I worked. So I planted them off camera. And they do require a little bit of explanation. So I can find them first. Here we go. 
So pumpkin seeds need to be planted in a kind of wide open area because they grow more like natural pumpkins do, where they'll grow a big vine here, and then there's a chance that in one of these four directions, it will grow a secondary vine, and so on and so on. So you can get a vine out to, I think, five squares from the center. So you need an 11 by 11 space, potentially. Although I really have seen them mostly stick to maybe three or four blocks from the central square. And then, randomly, off of these extra vines, you can then get pumpkins growing. And because of this branching off of the central square here, while you still need the ground to be moistened, it's better to put a block of water one diagonal away from the farmland. But we should get a lot of pumpkins out of this. I planted four seeds. Would have been five, but scythe, you know. So we'll see how many we get. So I keep up my head on that. Prep work and plaster. How do we go about that? Well, plaster is made using quicklime and sand. And to get quicklime, you need to bake lime in a fire pit, and each two pieces of lime that you bake at the same time will bake into one quicklime. Now this happens at 825 degrees Celsius, so you can't do it with firewood, but you can do it with peat or anything else that burns hotter. Now it takes a while for this stack to heat up to temperature. And while you can technically just drop a stack in and walk away and come back later, you're going to find you're only going to have three or four pieces of quicklime for every stack of peat that you put in. And that's because once this gets the temperature, it will cook the quicklime over the course of about 20 seconds. But then the entire stack drops back to room temperature and it has to start the heating process all over again. And you'll see that here in a moment. So here I've gotten the temperature, and it will take about one full brick of peat, just shy of a full brick of peat. And now the whole stack is cold again. And we do this over and over again. So we just burned through three and a half bricks of peat to cook one piece of quicklime. How can we make this more efficient? Well, one is if you only have one fire pit or a very short tension span, what you can do is let it heat the temperature and once the stack reaches about halfway cooked, you can pull out some, or most, preferably, of the stack. So we're going to pull out half the stack by right-clicking, and then use Control and scroll down until we just have two in there. Now the stack you can see in our hand is still red hot. When I put it back in with just two pieces, it starts at 836 degrees, because that's what it was when we pulled it out. Now the stack in your hand will cool over time. Uh, typically every three or four pieces of quick lime you cook, you'll find that the stack starts to cool down and you need to put it back in. But you can put it in for just a second or two, take it back out, and it will sort of reset that cool down timer. Now that's all well and good, but we have this much lime to bake. I don't feel like standing in front of this fire for 30, 40 minutes baking quick lime one at a time. So what we can do here is we can do a thing you shouldn't do at home, and we're going to make a whole bunch of extra fire pits. And we're going to borrow some of this firewood, and we're just make ten fire pits. Once they're made, you can take the firewood back out. So now we have ten fire pits in addition to our normal one, and what we can do is we can open each of these up, and we'll probably want to change these to be movable, which you can do by hitting this hamburger menu button here and picking movable. And we're going to move our main fire pit to right up here at the top of the screen. And then we will open each of these and we'll move them just a little bit so that they don't get in each other's way. So there we now have 10 fire pits all open on our screen at once. It's going to be fun. So let us put some more peat in there. And we will start heating that up if we can. We have to move a little bit. Can we light you again? Yeah, there we go. Okay. So then we will put about half a stack of peat each in these pits here. And then we'll see if we can reach around this pillar and grab our lime. We'll also find out if we have asbestos legs. I don't think we burn in fires, but 
We're going to find out. Here we go. We've just gotten the stack up the temperature, so we're going to do this. Leave the rest in here. Now we're going to try to peer around this, get into our chest there, and we'll pull out this line, and we'll sit here in our command and control center until this is done. So I will see you all on the other side. And like that, we have our four and a half stacks. I have a little bit more out in our chest outside. I put down here for sort of a work chest. And until morning, I think I'm going to take this bony soil downstairs and I'm going to pan it after I put away this quicklime. And we'll see what we have come morning. Now, that was a very successful night of panning. And on top of that, the drifters have gone away. From the panning, we got, in no particular order, two more rusty gears, two more copper spearheads, a set of tin bronze scales, ten flint arrowheads, fourteen flax fibers, two more native silver nuggets, twenty bones, seven copper arrowheads, two emeralds, and we got a silver chain, which is a kind of jewelry we can wear. Where does it go? Oh, it goes on our wrist. You know, I'm going to keep our bronze armlet you can see it over here when we have our armor off. Which reminds me, so notice how beat up our armor is. We're down to 560 out of 900 durability. And I believe after our encounter with a wolf in the last episode, it was down to something like 800, 820. I got hit twice, by once by a nightmare drifter and once by a two-headed drifter, and now we're at 560. So that is the kind of damage you can expect to receive. And you know, I almost suspect that the brigandine legs took one of those hits. I think the nightmare drifters hit harder, or at least are a higher tier. So that may have been the body armor. But each armor will take a hit, and it's randomly distributed with 50% going to your body, 30% to your legs, and 20% to your head. I'm going to put this stuff away, and then we will get back to building. So, in order to make plaster, we have quicklime, and we need to mix it with sand. And we have one, two, three, three stacks of sand right here. And each combination of quicklime and sand will get us one plaster. So, that's why we needed so much quicklime and so much sand, is that each one only gets you one block of plaster, which... I have thoughts on that. Now plaster kind of acts like a rock. It says it's material stone, except that once you place it, you can still break it with a pickaxe and you'll get the block back. And unlike mud bricks, you always get the block back. Similar to the barn and the coop, I want to get together a build pallet so I sort of know what I'm going to be working with as I build each part of the house. I want to use some shale, some shale cobblestone, around the base of the house, sort of as a foundation. And then, for the main walls, I want to be using some plaster. For some trim, I think I'm going to be using some granite stone brick. I think I might do some chiseling on the corners of the house and sort of reinforce it with a stone brick. In places where we have wooden trim, I think I want to use walnut. Much better. I'm thinking some small window cells, maybe. I'm also thinking that places where we have stone trim that's not on the corners of the house, I might like to use this granite dry stone. I'm thinking maybe like wooden window sills, and we'll use the walnut paned leaded glass, like in our home here. And then around that, we'll have this sort of dry stone trim. That might look pretty nice. Lastly, we have the roof. Now, the roofs can be a bit of a hassle because I do want to use this slate roof, the actual shingles, for things like awnings over windows and maybe the doorway or portico, whatever we have. However, the main roof, I want it to be a tall roof. I want it to be a 22 and a half degree angle. So we're going to have to resort to using slate cobblestone kind of like we used on the coop over there, 
But rather than going horizontally and sort of flattening it, I want to go vertically and make it a tall roof, like so. And this will require probably some chiseling here, just like the coop roof, to make it a little less stair-steppy. So, with all this in mind, I think it's time to go and start laying out the foundation of our house. But that means tearing down our little safe house here and at least one of our farms for Cooper's Reeds. And I was hoping they'd have grown by now, but I guess we're going to have to just tear them out before they get a chance to. Let's get shoveling. That's one down. Now for those reeds. Well, the reeds have been harvested and rehomed over behind the farms there, and we'll get to these in a bit once we've harvested them for the first time this year. And now it is time to start with the foundation of the house. Now, I'm thinking I'm probably going to flatten this by one more block and bring the house down to this level, which will put it on the same Y height as the barn. Because as much as I might not mind having it be a little more prominent in the landscape, I'm thinking this is going to be a pretty tall house because of the roof. So I don't think that raising the foundation up is going to do anything for it. So I think I'm also going to fill in some of this junk here. And we will have to fill in probably this guy over here. And then we'll start getting the foundation in. Okay, so I have marked out the corners, both the inside and outside corners here, of the general shape of the initial house. Now, I kind of see this as an evolving project. I think we will be coming back to this build while we're living in it, and we'll be adding additions to the house and upgrades and so on. But for now, this is going to be the basic shape and size of the house. Notice it's about two to two and a half times as large as our current house, and that will also give us an equivalently larger basement. Now I'm also thinking of putting a little patio out here in the back that may end up being upgraded to some kind of like, I don't know, three seasons room, or at least some kind of walled in porch, but we will get to that later. Now for the foundation, this house, I want the door to be two blocks off the ground, not just one. So actually kind of like our current house. So we'll go up two blocks before we start putting in our floor. Or actually our floor will be at this level here and we'll stay on top of that. Now I want the foundation to sort of pop out a little from the house. So I'm gonna set these one block out from where I put the house corners. And we will just misclick or the click on grass and place blocks where we don't want them to go. Okay, and then I think I want to have a bit of sort of reinforcement on some of these corners here. So I'm just going to put these here, like so. There we go. Next, we're going to come in with our plaster. And I'm probably going to have to go and make a trip to gather some more because we have nowhere near enough sand. And let's get some of the bottom parts of these walls put in. And I am going to be leaving a gap here for now. We aren't likely to do the basement in this episode. So for now, we're going to have just sort of an air gap between the first floor and the basement, or the ground floor and the basement, depending on where you're from. Here we go. So we'll go ahead and bring these out here. Okay, so there we have the basic first layer of wall for our house. I'm thinking that the 
door is going to be right in the middle of this section here. Which looks like it's going to be about here. Just mark that. Okay, so, do I have a door? No, I don't. Now I do. So, I want to put this door... No, not like that. Like that. And then, now we're stuck. Oh, grass, get out of the way. Okay, and then... I think what we'll do is, I want to have a similar kind of portico to what we have there, but it'll be pointed this direction over here. And I want that to also be out of the shale cobblestone, at least for the base of it. So let's see, let's do, come out at least two, probably three. I want a two block wide staircase. And then we'll bring it down here. And maybe it would be worth going out one more. So we don't have simply a one block wide path at the door. Let's try that. So let's do this. And I will replace these with something else. I'm thinking we'll use path blocks for the stairs. But then up here, maybe some, maybe some polished shale. And our first step up would be here, so we have just a little bit of extra flanking on the stairs. Our first full block here, second here, and then, yeah, we'd be, to, we'd be at the top. And I actually might just use the path blocks up here, too. Let's give those a shot. Now, path blocks are made by taking the dirt and just taking a stack of stone and putting them on top. Now, that will give you Four stone and one dirt will give you one stone path, and we already have a full stack of that. What we're interested in right now are the slabs, and I want just four of these. There we go. And we're going to do one, two, and then let's just sort of fill you in so we don't break things and fall. Although, we're going to see that dirt because path blocks are one sixteenth or one thirty second of a block shorter than a full block. So anything that you put under here is going to show. So let's just, I guess, do that. I don't want to waste them, but I don't need to. I might change that out for something else, maybe granite cobblestone later. And then we're going to take these out and path blocks. Now, path blocks are interesting because they have a property that no other block does. Is that when you walk on them, you move 20% faster than when you're on other ground. So here's a normal walking speed. On here, as you can see, it's a little bit faster. It's even more pronounced when you run. We're off. And we're on. So path blocks can be used to make long roads to places you visit regularly. So we have our path blocks up here, we have our little sort of stone flanking it, and let's see, we're going to need one more of these here, that's for sure, and then we will also continue this flanking just down to there. We don't want this one to be lowered because that would lower the foundation, so we'll leave it like that. And then, since this block will get covered up, we are going to pull this up, since I am kind of short on plaster. Please don't tell the building inspector. I'll get in a lot of trouble for this. And let's start the second row of wall blocks. Now this time we can't cheap out on the corners because they will be visible. And there is the start. And right in here will be our first floor. Now, I clearly need some more sand, but I'm going to save that till morning. So why don't we go ahead and get some flooring going in here, because I have an idea of what I want to use. But I also wanted to play around with some other potential options. I wanted to see about using some larch for the floors. Larch has a very nice, smooth tone to it. You know, I'll bring along a few other options as well. And I'm only looking at 
wooden options for now and we're only covering options that are available to us at the moment so we're not going to be looking at anything made of kapok or purple heart or ebony that kind of thing the one that i think i want to use just because i've seen it used before is larch So Larch has this nice pale wood color. It's sort of like a, a more modern oak finish that you see in a lot of newer homes, ones that still have hardwood flooring. It doesn't have that sort of honeyed aged quality to it that you get from floors varnished and left to sit for 20, 25 years. Now, in a similar color, we have Birch. However, Birch is just sort of a a messier looking floor. It looks like it's been left to to molder. You know, you've scuffed up some of the finish on it and you didn't, you know, wax it or refinish it right away. So some of that wood has started to sort of age and oxidize and turn gray. And I've used it before, before larch was a thing. I used birch as sort of a nice light flooring. And for not having other options, birch was fine. But now that I have other options, I mean, look at it. So I think we're going to skip out on the birch. Maple is pretty much a no-go in general. It's not bad in this quantity, but again, also we're looking at it alongside other green things. And maple has this green tone that's clearer to see if I sort of block out the rest of the, the dirt. It has a kind of green tone we've been saving for outdoors stuff. So we're going to skip that too. Walnut might go well with the larch as an accent. It has a different tone in addition to being darker, but it still has a few of those pinker notes to it. So I might do something with both the larch and the walnut, but I'm undecided yet. If I do anything, it'll likely be a ring of the lighter wood around the edge of the house a ring of the darker wood around the edge inside that, and then the rest of the interior would be more of the larch. We also have pine, and pine's a nice color, but we have already used a lot of pine, so I kind of just want to get away from it. It might make a nice sort of checkerboard floor with larch or something else. We also have oak, which is kind of like a, a slightly redder version of the walnut, and a little bit lighter too. This would probably also go well. Actually, it almost matches too well with the larch. I don't know. It might sort of get lost if I were to do a ring of oak within the larch. And our last option is aged wood at this moment. And we don't have a ton of this, but we would have enough to do the house. And while I like the contrast that this has with the plaster, it's so dark and it's kind of green, which I don't really mind, aside from the fact that I don't like the maple for the same reason, but it's just so dark and our house colors are dark gray, white, and eventually gray from the stone bricks. So I'd kind of like to have a splash of at least some kind of color in here. And I think pretty much any of these other options are going to serve us better in that regard. So I'm going to, oh yes, I forgot. I took off my mask and my hood uh, to preserve their durability for next winter. So you see my face now, woohoo. Anyway, I'm going to play around with the floor here and I'll bring all back when I have something to show you. Okay, it has been about a day since we last checked in and I wanted to show you what I've come up with. So first of all, I've sort of roughed in where I want the windows to go. Uh, all around the house. I put in a couple extra exits here as well as here out onto the eventual back patio. And I haven't decided what I want to do with these thresholds yet. They might stay as granite rocks, but we'll see. And inside, I've also worked on roughing in some of the interior rooms. So we're going to have this here as like a entryway slash parlor. And I do plan on having a staircase that goes up this way and turns here and continues up to our second floor. I want to have a fireplace here and I used the cobblestone just to 
note to myself that it'll be different, but I do want to use, I think fire clay bricks would look really nice here. And I want to also do some chiseling to sort of get the bricks sort of like bricked into the wall here. Uh, and then I'll go sort of up to the ceiling where it'll sort of convert into a chimney and go up through the second floor. This, this space right here, I think is going to be a little special. It's going to be a little decorative place for us to sit and read books, a book nook. In here, since we have the fireplace access, this will be our kitchen. And I'm thinking of putting some clay ovens, maybe over here, um, or yeah, probably over here, which is adjacent to what will be sort of our basement stairwell. We have a little bit of storage here, uh, and then we will have a stairwell that goes down here and into our eventual cellar. And then lastly over here, this is sort of a nice big room that at the moment I'm thinking of turning into a dining room, which has no real function, but in the earlier parts of us living in this house, I think it might sort of be a project room. As for the floors, I did go with the larch and walnut slabs, but rather than putting a ring of larch and then walnut and then larch again, I just put the walnut around the outside and I kind of like the sort of pattern of light, dark, light, rather than going light, dark, light, light. Also, I ended up with a lot of rooms that just didn't have any larch at all in them or too much larch. Like this room was almost too bright and being a stairwell, I wanted to be a little bit darker. For fire safety around the fireplace, I put some polished shale rocks and some polished granite rocks on both sides. And I'm currently using polished granite for the thresholds between all of the rooms. Uh, that might change, but I was playing around with a bunch of different ideas and this is the one that I liked the most so far. Now, throughout all of this, I've been using a lot of plaster and it has come to my attention that uh, I don't think I have enough plaster. Uh, I think we're going to need to go and grind up a whole bunch more limestone into lime and cook it into quicklime. Probably almost as much, or maybe as much if not more, than we've already made. And I made something like 14 or so stacks of quicklime. So yeah, we'll have to see how that goes. And since I just looked over and was reminded of it, let's check out our fields and see how they're doing. Ooh, yes, we have a big old field of flax going here. Very nice. That should be ready in probably only a day or two. We've got onions growing, cabbages, some rye, and a second field of flax, partial field of flax. So we're doing pretty well over here for crops. Well, I'm going to keep roughing in the exterior and some of the interior, which reminds me of these bricks for the fireplace. There is some... Really? Right here. Right now? You had to? <sighs> As I was saying, that brings us to something else that you can do with quicklime. And that is, you can turn it into mortar. And with mortar, you can turn bricks and mortar into brick blocks. And you can do that as soon as you unforget where you put your bricks. Ah, here we go. Next, we need a bucket of water, check. And we want a barrel. And I'm just gonna make a fresh barrel from our good old friend, Maple Boards. And this barrel is going to go in, I think, the cellar. We have some more room to spread out here. Perfect. I pity whoever has to sleep in that bed. And we're just going to go ahead and fill this up. And then we're going to remember that slaked lime, which is required for mortar, is full of drifters. Oh my. Requires a lot less water than I thought. Yeah, 
There we go. I think 16 ought to do it. Because slaked lime, which is required for mortar, requires one liter of water, two, four units of quick lime. So we're going to go ahead and just drop you in there. There we go. A full barrel of slaked lime. And now we put in our sand. Bam. And now we have a whole ton of mortar. Now, mortar when you first pick it up will stack higher than 64 but when you start splitting it out into smaller stacks it will then recap at 64 so if you don't want to fill an inventory with mortar try to keep it in one piece if you can anyway now that we have our mortar we can drop it in our crafting grid in the middle and surround it with clay bricks of our chosen type in this case being fire clay and we will get four fire clay bricks for each eight actual bricks and one piece of mortar and then I will probably meet back with you all in the morning after these guys go away. Okay, so it is morning and I ran away from the house to make the drifters despawn. And I noticed, as I did, that our pumpkins have been growing. Look at that. And look at that, we're growing new rifts too. Of course. And in fact, over here I saw that we even have some mature pumpkins. That's exciting. So as you can see, these pumpkin vines sort of spread out over a pretty wide area. Now these, these are kind of small, but they're not tiny. Got like one, two. And what will happen is occasionally you'll see one that withers, which is the one that I broke in that first one that we inspected. Withered vines you can break safely, and sometimes I don't, I don't know if it actually does, but I feel like it does allow more vines to spread in that direction. Because these vines will grow randomly, and they will also die randomly and they will also have a chance to gain flowers. And flowering pumpkin vines, or blooming pumpkin vines, have a chance to spawn pumpkins next to them. And in this case, ours are already grown up. Now, they actually start smaller. We must have missed them entirely in their growth stages, but they do start as small green pumpkins, and slowly they grow in size, and they fade from green to orange, and we have our pumpkins. And pumpkins are a somewhat unique vegetable. You can eat them whole, but you can't cook them whole in a meal. You used to be able to until I think version 1.15, somewhere in there. And when you cook them into a meal, they, they added so much nutrition to a meal, it was, it was crazy. You could basically put a pumpkin in nothing but water and be full for the whole day. So to use them in meals, you have to actually put them in your grid with a knife and you get four slices out of each one. Now we're not gonna do that because I don't need them yet and I don't want them to perish. Uh, but you can also turn the pumpkins into one seed each. And this is the only vegetable that I know of that you have to actually turn the vegetable into the seed. So we're actually gonna do that because just in case we don't get any more pumpkins out of those vines, I wanna make sure we have a few to start over. The chances of that happening are pretty slim because most pumpkin vines, I think, grow an average of 2.5 pumpkins. So we are likely to get at least, what, 10 pumpkins out of that on average. So let's go and we're going to remove these cobblestone blocks and we're going to put in these fire clay bricks. Yes, that gives a nice warmth to the scene. We'll do that over here too. I was thinking of putting more than two clay ovens in, but I think two might be the best. Maybe I could fit one in over here and do three. Hmm. Yeah, we'll do it. Why not? And there we go. So we'll put three clay ovens there. So I'm going to go ahead and keep building up some of these walls and roughing in things, and I will document our progress as we go. Well, I think it is pretty clear that we do not have enough plaster for this job. Oh, did I mention our house is going to be two, three stories tall with an attic? 
So I'm going to go and spend the next 20 years of my life grinding limestone, and then the following 20 years cooking it all into quicklime. So keep an eye on that date in the upper left-hand corner, and uh, yeah, we'll see how long this takes. Wait a second. Didn't someone comment that you can actually break limestone with a hammer? Oh boy, have I been wasting my time. Finish this stack, and then we're going to grab a hammer and see if that's true. Hammer. Oh. Oh, that hurts. That hurts the hammer. But, uh, that hurts my brain less and my social life. Well, I know what we're doing now. Let's pour us some more hammers. More sand. And with that ugliness out of the way, let's get back to placing down some plaster. So here is the general shape of the house. Now that it's sort of coming into existence, you can see we have some very tall pointy roofs to do in the very near future. And that future is going to be right after I go mine up some slate. And for the time being, we're going to leave the second floor empty. Uh, one, because I don't have the materials for it, and two, I don't have the lighting for it. I only have these three extra lamps here, or lanterns, and I don't want to create a second floor that's going to be super duper dark. Well, I'm going to go and mine out a whole ton of slate so that we can get started on this roof. We interrupt your normal show to bring you the special programming. Temporal storm imminent. Oops. Right as it ended, too. So now might be a good time to point out that when you die, all of your nutrition gets cut roughly in half which does mean that your hit points will take a bit of a hit after you've been killed once. So watch out and, like in any game, try not to die too much. Okay, so we're off to the slate farm. So I've done some back of the napkin math and determined that I'm gonna need roughly about 11 stacks of cobblestone slabs of slate and probably about a stack may, and maybe some change of slate cobblestone stairs. So I have brought in my backpack, I have a reed basket, a bunch of blue clay to make these while we're there, and also brought our slabs just so we can keep count of how much we have. We have two and a half slabs currently, and so we need about just over three times more than we already have of the slabs, and then stack or so of the stairs. So I was just digging over here and dug into a cave I don't recognize. I'll sort of scoot around this way and take a look inside there. Huh. Okay, so this is like mostly the cave. There's a little bit more back that way. I wonder what's over here. Let's find out. This is a weird cave. I have never seen generation like this. This is both cool and creepy at the same time. Flowing water is kind of annoying. Okay, well that's really weird, but uh, I like it. Is that olivine? You're kidding me. You have got to be kidding me. That is olivine. Wow, that is. Okay, cool. That's really close. That's super close. Huh. We will need that later when we get into steel making. 
and it can also be used for making green glass, but that's sort of a... just for a decorative. But that is really cool to know. That is a nice find. Okay, we have our 8, 9, 10, 11 stacks of slabs. We've got our one stack of stairs, and I got a few more stacks of stones just in case we needed more for other projects. Anyway, I'm going to grab this and toss it on my back. I'll pick up my torches, and let's head home and keep on building. Okay, now this is neat. I just looked back to see if our pear tree was doing anything, and it is dropping petals. That is so cool. I didn't know it did that. One and a half more days of flowering. Okay. Well, that is super cool. I That is just a neat touch. One for good luck. Well, I'm going to get to it and get this roof in, and I'll bring you all back when it's done. And what do you think, everyone? Here is our very steep-roofed house. Conical, like a big old pointy hat. And as I was working, I realized that this seems a little flat here, so what I might do is I'll come in a little bit later and I will pop out a dormer here and one on the other side over there. And I don't have enough plaster for that right now and I don't think we're going to get enough back by knocking out any interior walls or anything for like making room for windows. So I'll have to make some more plaster up, fun fun and come back to that in a little bit. But there was one final touch I wanted to do on the roof, make sure I have enough materials. I think I do. Let's do it here first. And I wanna come here with this and a bit of that, and then some of this. Sort of looked like iron grating or fences on the top. Fences to keep out the rifts like that. What are you doing here? And then we'll come do it on the top part of the roof too. Yes, that looks much better. Oh, that looks so much better. Now, before we get to any of the real detail chiseling, I want to do some of the sort of rough stuff. And that includes this shell cobblestone along here, because this is sort of really blocky right now. I want to give you an idea of what this is going to look like when we're all done here. So, we're going to hit this and do a bit of that. And I didn't want to use the stairs here because they're much closer to the ground, so we'll be seeing all of their texture. And the stairs have this sort of funny double-layered squish texture to them. You can see it from the side here. They have sort of a repeating texture. In fact, even if I... whoops. If I fall. Here we go. If you look at it from the side, you even see that there's a seam right here. So I wanted to sort of skip out on that and have sort of a smoother look to the texture. So that's why I opted for that. It uses a bit more stone, but honestly, not much. It does use some more time and chisel, but it'll survive. Ooh! I heard that. Where? Are you in the house? Is that call coming from inside the house? Or are they below us? Yeah, I mean, I don't see them. Hmm. And we don't have a basement yet, so... That'll be fun. And there we go. So now we have some sort of corner bracing for the house, and sort of a nice flared foundation at the base here. And... We'll come back in later with some more chisel work for the roof and some other areas. Well, everyone, that's our house all done. With windows and everything. Complete. 100%. Totally. That's right. Just kidding. However, that is all we're going to have time for in this episode. So I'm going to work a little bit on that dormer, probably off camera. 
And then in the next episode, I think we're going to cover something brand new in addition to some of the house detail work. I do want to work on some of the exterior chiseling and some other new additions. And I'm getting a little tired of our tools breaking all the time and having to make new ones. So I think it is time to make our next big technological step. I want to move to the Bronze Age. And that is what I think we'll do next episode. Anyway, as always, my name has been Kurazar. Thank you all for watching. And I'll see you in the next one.